You know, you can do many things and your, the choice remains yours. And even today, with the world coming to pieces, the choice is still ours, what we do with what God has given us. That's what the song's about. <clears throat> I can be strong, I can be brave, I can be free or be a slave. I can forgive as he forgave. The choice is mine. I can grow through in storm or gale. I can desert or set my sail. I can be blown. The choice is mine. If I would live, then I must die and bid this fleeting world goodbye. Its treasures dear, I must deny. The choice is mine. I'll walk by faith where I am led. It matters not what lies ahead. And if my path be crimson red, the choice is mine. I can have faith, I can have fear, I can believe that God is near, or I can doubt the things I hear, the choice is mine. I can draw close, or I can stray. I can submit, or go my way. Within my heart, I hear him say, the choice is mine. If I the king of heaven choose, if I the things of earth refuse, the best I gain, the worst I lose, the choice is mine. Because he gave his life for me, because of love at Calvary, I take him for eternity. The choice is mine. We have choices to make today, and I hope you'll make the right ones in these days. I believe you've made the right choice to come here. Our church has been given the job of getting out a message. It started in 1970, the particular message we're working with, and God has given us the grace and the means to get it out. And I can tell you tonight that it's going far and wide. We're hearing from many nations of the earth now where the tapes and books are going and they're growing. There's a growing demand even behind the Iron Curtain for the material. And so if you keep praying, God will keep opening doors. The prophecy that set this thing in motion many years ago came through. The first prophecy that ever came through in the tiny little church over in the tip of South Chicago, one of the things it said was that God had opened a door before us, had taken off all the shackles and all the fetters, and that Satan would not be permitted to hinder us if we would be faithful. That's all that God wanted was for us to be faithful. Then he would see that it was done. And he's been true to that all the way through. We have stumbled and bumbled and, and uh, mumbled and grumbled at times, but... Uh, overall, we've managed to keep on the trail. And God has done miracles beyond anything we ever dreamed of when it first started. He's done things he'd set, he talked to me about in dreams and visions, but he, uh, well, they were just a little hard to accept. 
And you say, well, I never heard about them. Well, I don't go around telling everything. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's enough people shooting their mouth off of things that never come to pass. It's better just keep your mouth shut and watch God work sometimes and teach people the Word of God and let, let Him work in their lives. That's what it's all about. Tonight we're going to talk about deception and witchcraft in the church and how to deal with it. The reason I'm uh, coming down this trail tonight is because there is afoot in our nation today a terrible heresy that anything goes as long as you love one another. And that you can just do anything you like and nobody should ever say anything. No contrary words, no contrary winds. That is so far into scripture. I'm not even going to deal with the Old Testament scriptures about it tonight. Although tomorrow night we're going to talk about some things and then uh, we'll get, uh, Saturday we'll get into some more things. I'm just going to be on the war path, I think, all this, war, this workshop, it looks like. Because there is so much going on and the, and the people of God are being fleeced by con men in the pulpits and behind uh, in, on TV and radio. So many of them. And I have to draw the conclusion somebody made a mistake. Somebody didn't get called or if they did get called they've certainly gone away from what they knew. And so many people now everybody's talking about spiritual warfare and nobody's doing it mountain thing because if it were if spiritual warfare was being practiced biblical spiritual warfare were being practiced on a large scale in some of these massive groups that gather this whole nation would be turning upside down paying fruit grass get turned over but you see the trouble is even the leaders in these movements don't know enough uh, they're either ignorant or they're willingly ignorant and ignoring the truth of what's going on and what's really happening. And we can't do a whole lot about that except warn people to stay away from those things. Warn them to stay away from the adulterated, watered down version called spiritual warfare, which is, amounts to saning minnows and looking for water bugs instead of going after the sharks and the whales that are down deep in the, in the murky waters down there. These people, uh, I can't find anywhere that they're doing anything more than superficial. They're scratching the surface. When it comes to real deliverance, they run like a herd of scared chickens Amen. because they just simply don't want to get involved. It's not nice. And above all, we must be nice. You know, the scriptures, they say, well, you know, if somebody does something that's wrong, that's doctrinally wrong, then you shouldn't say anything. You should just love the brothers. Love the brothers. Love the brothers. You heard a lot of that when the PTL manure pile exploded. Uh, I mean, from coast to coast, you had all these great ministers rushing to the rescue of poor Jim and poor Tammy. A few weeks, weeks later, they were in wholesale retreat. Yuck! Good Lord. They got the manure all over them, you see. Because what they revealed is that they didn't know anything. They had no discernment. They also did not know biblical principles or they would have recognized that what PTL was doing was unscriptural. What some of the other ministries have done is unscriptural. That's why it's folding up. That's why it's coming apart at the seams. God is not responsible. And I say again, demons are raising millions of dollars to support false ministries. Now you let that soak in. I'll tell you something else. It's going to be interesting when we get to heaven to find out how many of these healings we see pictured on TV. And I'm in favor of God healing. I sure am. But a lot of those things are demonically done and others may be genuinely done, but the people through whom they're working are getting no credit whatsoever with God because they have sold out for filthy lucre and fame and power. And whatever gift they have, if it's a genuine war, a working in among, when they get to heaven, they're going to be the most surprised person on earth because they're not going to, uh, they're, well, they won't be on earth then, but they'll be surprised in heaven too because they're not going to get any credit whatsoever, zero minus. They said, but I did it. Well, you did it for the wrong reason. You wanted people to like you and love you, and they did. You wanted everybody to clap their hands and, and, and uh, turn flips when you walked on the platform. They did. 
You wanted to be the most popular. You were. You wanted to have lots of money. You did. You forgot all about Jesus. You forgot all about Paul. You forgot all about the servants of God in the past. But none of these things were true. You say, oh, old sour grapes whirly. There he goes again. Yeah, that's what they said a long time ago when I started beating the PTL drum. There's some more coming down. You mark it. Mr. Roberts is not through disassembling. He's going to have to disassemble some more. And there's some more coming down because they're not built on scriptural roots, I'm telling you. And God will not support that which he doesn't initiate. But demons will. Religious spirits will. And they'll, because religious spirits control multiplied thousands of people, they'll rush them right in there and the gullible gooses will give and borrow money and everything else and throw it down for these people to walk on them. The Bible does not know anything about this idea of don't say anything about it because just pray for the brother. Whatever you do, don't be critical. You mustn't get people critical. It's time we got critical. Friend, when they do it on TV, when they do it publicly and openly, when the tapes and the, and the TV and the radio programs are going everywhere, there's no need for anybody to go to them privately and say, Brother, I think you're an error. That poison, that pollution they're spewing out is affecting everybody, and I warn my people every time I hear about it. We just learn of a real slick new way to get demons out. I better pass this on to you while I'm thinking about it. You won't get your notepad. You won't want to miss this. This is really good. This came out of a man who long, some years ago, was taught it as the greatest thing in deliverance, and he blew out because he wasn't scriptural in the first place. He didn't know the first thing about scriptures, and he finally ran off and left his wife and kids and, and married somebody else's uh, gal. And now he's traveling around. He's back at a church some, uh, somewhere in the area, far away. And he came through a couple of months ago. Guess what? That dear man, that stupid guy. I'm trying to find a name that won't be too bad. That'll describe him. He came through and he said, Now I'll tell you folks, you don't have to spit, cough, snort, scream or holler and fight to get rid of demons. All you people that are depressed, you have depression, come down the aisle of the front. Boy, here they came. The gooses came. Cluck, cluck, cluck. Here they came. Chuck, 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 chuck. <laughs> it's like birds in the nest waiting to be fed. And he fed them. Boy, did he stuff them. He said, Now I want you to take an imaginary shovel. Everybody get one. They all got them. Now I want you to dig an imaginary grave. I want the instruments to play funeral music. They dug an imaginary grave. Now, order the depression spirits to get in that grave while the funeral music was playing, you know. And when they did that, now cover them up. And boy, they took their imaginary shovel, took the imaginary dirt and covered it in that imaginary hole over those imaginary demons. I imagine that worked pretty good for imaginary demons. I don't think it'd work on the real ones, but, you know, it... If you've got enough imagination to stretch far enough, you can, you can really come up. I think I'd take a steam shovel myself and go after them. You know, get a bunch. Don't just fool with one or two. But anyway, they covered them up, and then they, they had to do the Joshua march, you know, two, 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 around the city, you know. And, and they have to shout and praise the Lord and pray in tongues, and they're playing happy music now. Happy, happy, happy. We're all free, free, free. And now the demons are gone. Whoopee and... And the poor people go back and they think, oh, I just feel so much better. And the religious spirits say, that's right. We came in by the scabs while you were doing all that foolishness. Well, if you don't want to really do the real thing, you can come up with all kinds of new wrinkles. That's a new revelation. Our revelations don't work that easy. They require dedication, scripture, Willingness to work, willingness to sacrifice, willingness to love. These new wrinkles always come up with something that it's all imaginary. And when you get through your deliverance, it's also imaginary. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Paul writes, 
to a place where he has led them to the Lord, got them baptized in the Holy Spirit, cast out demons, and seen miraculous healings, and established a strong local church. After he left, some dear ones came through with new revelations. I guess they brought imaginary shovels and holes and everything else too. I don't know. They came through though. And they began to put them in bondage. Bondage to religious things that had been left behind by the grace of God. And Paul writes and said, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has cast a spell over you? The reason, you ask people, say, well, why did, the, how could they ever go off and believe that? They believe the right things. And then how could they believe that? Because of witchcraft. It's called charismatic witchcraft. Meaning that it parades as real, genuine, biblical truth, but it's actually witchcraft methods that press people into leaving the truth. And Paul says, oh, you foolish Galatians. And Paul didn't call anybody foolish un without re realizing. Because, you know, the Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. These Galatians were behaving as if there was no God. And that's what false teachers will cause you to do. They left off the true teachings that they had been established on. And he said, who has cast a spell over you? Who has put a witchcraft spell on you? That uh, ye should not obey the truth. False teachers will cause you to leave the truth and turn your back on it. We've had people come through here. If all of them that were ever, ever were in this church showed up out here, we could, we'd fill the parking lot and overflow into the streets in every, every direction. Did you know that? You say, well, you didn't hold on to them. Well, we didn't try to. That's God's business. They're his young'uns, we hope. If they're his, it's his business to hold on to them. And we have people, one pattern emerges from the people who strut out of here with their nose out of joint. Now, some people move because God moves them across country. And they, uh, as somebody remarks, that if I leave Hagwish, I'm going to go out through the hugging line, not the other way. That means they leave in good fellowship and, and good favor with the people. They're not angry with anybody. They're not charging on saying, I'm tired of this one. But they, they leave because God is moving them to a different place. Those kind of people come back. I see several of them out there today, tonight. People who have been here for a length of time in the past. And they, they come back in and they, it's just like old home week. They come back and say, oh, it's so good to be back home. See, because we don't bar anybody. Well, take that back. There's been three or four. I put the clamps on. You don't work witchcraft here and not repent, and then you stay. It's bye-bye baby for you. But, because I don't believe in this soft cornball stuff, you know, we'll be sweet to them and they'll repent. They better repent in a hurry. If they're damaging the sheep, I'll tell you, this is one shepherd gets on the warpath fast. If you're skinning the sheep's head, you better look out because I've got a skinner bigger than yours. And your head's going to be skinned next. And that's my job, protect the flock. And I'll protect them, even if people don't like it. Now, he says, who has cast a spell over you? People that have left here. Here's the usual pattern. They get into deliverance. They get excited. They say, oh, the word of God is wonderful. I never understood it this way before. They get all excited about learning the Bible. They get excited about deliverance. They get deliverance. They begin to minister in deliverance. And they tell their friends and they bring people in. This has happened many times. And they keep on going. And then there comes a time when there's something in their life and God said, it's time to deal with this. And they say, uh-uh. This far and no further. Now, Lord, let's don't, get, let's don't get nosy. Let's don't get nosy into my business here. You know, I, I've gone, you know, I'm better than most people. I know, I, know how to get, I know how to do the warfare prayers. I know all this good stuff. And the Lord said, yeah, but it's time to deal with that thing that's down deep inside of you. And they say, no. Well, now, you know, it's kind of hard to say no to God because you realize what an idiot you are when you do that. So you don't say that out loud. You look around and say, I'll tell you, Worley's not preaching like he used to. <laughs> the people are not as loving as they ought to be. I don't know why these people keep coming over and over again. I don't need any more deliverance. I don't know why they keep coming all the time. 
Probably because they got more sense than you have. They know they still got them and you're denying you've still got them. And they start being critical. The next thing you know, they don't come for prayer themselves because they don't need any prayer. And that's the dead giveaway. It won't be long until it'll be bye-bye. They'll be going out the door. They stop getting prayer, but they still pray for people because after all, anybody of superior knowledge and ability like myself should give themselves to the Lord and pray for these dumb people that keep coming again and again and again. Besides, it makes me feel kind of good because I know more than they do. And then go ahead and you say, well, does it do any good for them to pray? Oh, yeah. The name of Jesus works. When God put his words in, in a donkey's mouth, it worked. And sometimes you see some donkeys around, braying away, and it's working. But the donkey doesn't get any credit. He won't get any crowns in heaven for that. God used some strange things to get his work done. But remember this, motivation is all important. And those people gradually begin to be critical. The next thing you know, well, the people are not as loving at Hagwish as they used to be. I'll tell you something's happened. Sure has. Therefore, they refuse to deal with their sin problem, with their demon problem, and so the next thing you know, whoosh, out they go. And the next thing you know, it's as if they never heard of deliverance at all. And you know where they head? They always head for one of these, these centers. You know, the Christian centers. I don't know what's wrong with the name church. That's one the Bible uses. You know, it calls them a church. But today, that's anathema. I think I know why. It's because in a church, there's some things you don't do are inappropriate. But in a center, you can have just about anything you want to. You can go from soup to nuts. And it's fine because it's in a Christian center. Now, maybe I'm just being picky, but most of the centers I know are really... Something else. There's one not too far from here. Recently, the preacher preached on the talking donkey, and he led a donkey on stage. I guess his folks are dumb. They didn't know what one looked like. So he produced one. I saw two when I looked at the TV. But that <clears throat> <laughs> See, there I go. He made me critical now. He shouldn't have done that. But, you know, there's so many times that nothing is systematically preached over and over. And the Bible says to call it what it is. It's fake, it's phony, it's cotton candy, there's nothing to it. And Paul said, oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? He called those people that did that. You, they've come in and worked witchcraft on you. Now, Brother Paul, that was a dear group of evangelists who came through and they shared these marvelous revelations and they gave us prophecies and revelations. Um, he said, yes, and they worked witchcraft on you with that garbage. Just because you were babies, you got suckered in. You got a spell cast over it. And he said, why Jesus Christ was crucified right before your eyes, how in the thunder did you ever get off over there in left field with that bunch of unbelievers and compromise? And legalistic religious idiots. He said, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, that you're now made perfect in the flesh? Have you suffered many things in vain, if it be in vain? He said, you suffered a loss of everything. Some of you lost your jobs, you lost your families, you lost your friends and everything else, and you kept on walking for Jesus. Hallelujah, praise God. And now you've gone back. Have you suffered so many things in vain, now you've gone backwards because of a witchcraft spell. In Matthew 5, 19, and over in 15, 9, I believe it is. Matthew 5, 19, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so. He shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach these things, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And then over in Matthew 15, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And people, this is what's going on in most of the churches around the country. 
It's sad. It's tragic. It's time somebody woke up. Not everywhere, thank God. But a lot of the churches have been infiltrated so much that this is a description of them. And you notice that Jesus wasn't easy on this idea at all. He hit it head on. He didn't say, well, we need to pray for the little brethren because they're off. He said, you are, you're honoring me with your lips, but you're lying. And he said, you're going to be leased because you're breaking the commandments of God. Now, um, look over in um, 1 Timothy 1, beginning with verse 4. 1 Timothy 1, 4. Neither give, give heed to fables, which minister questions, rather than godly edifying, which is in the faith. Now the end of the commandment is charity or love out of a pure heart, and of a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside into vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, desiring to be teachers of the law, desiring to be teachers of the law. They don't even know the law. How can they teach what they don't even know? Understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. They just go around shooting their mouth off. And because they've got a lot of guts and say it's true and I want you to believe it. And people say, oh yes, all right, all right, all right. I mean, they, he, it's bound to be so if he's that excited about it, you know. Well, listen, I've seen people get excited about a lot of things that are not important. I've seen sports, uh, sportscasters go absolutely nuts over a little old wop-sided ball, pigskin being kicked around on the field. They just go absolutely berserk. I've seen people in the stands turn flips. You're welcome. 